traveling through our series called Armor Up, where we look at the book of Ephesians chapter 6, about the armor of God, which is beautifully given to us as a gift from God to protect us from the evil one. The, the piece of armor we're going to talk about this morning is the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, which is Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. We're in a battle. We are, uh, face our mortal enemy, uh, Satan, who has nothing but evil intent for us. He lies, he steals, he kills. His goal is to destroy. But God has given us armor and the sword of the Spirit, his word, the word of God, to fight against the evil one. We are given a sword that is capable of taking down evil ones. Sometimes I think we think about a sword of the spirit, we kind of think like something like this, like a flimsy little plastic knife. Have you ever been at like an event or a meal and they hand it out plastic silverware and then they hand you a steak and then you go and like try to cut that thing? Like, do I just pick it up and chew on it? You know, what do you do in those situations, right? You you cut it, you almost start a fire, you rub on the thing so long, right? We are we have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We have what we need, but I can't think of anyone better to say it than the great theologian Crocodile Dundee. Let's watch him. You got a light, buddy? Yeah, sure, kid. There you go. And your wallet. Nick, give him your wallet. What for? He's got a knife. <laughs> That's not a knife. That's a knife. You can tell when I was watching a lot of movies, right? That's not a knife. This is a knife. Got the sword of the Spirit. The very word of God. To do battle against the enemy of our soul. Not with a little, we don't have a little plastic cutlery dealing with. We've got all that we need. The all-powerful word that can change lives, can bring life where there's, where there's death. The writer of Hebrews says that the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and intentions of the heart, the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. We have what we need, my friends. We've got a knife. <laughs> We've got the word of God. It's the one tool in this is arsenal that, that Paul writes about, the armor that we have, the, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the feet shod with the, the gospel of peace. But the sword of the Spirit has defensive attributes to it, but it also has offensive, that we can take that against the enemy to destroy him. It is what Jesus used right after he was baptized, right when he began his ministry, he's baptized, and then he was led, it says, into the desert, the wilderness, and he's led there, and while he's there, Satan comes to tempt him, and three times in a row, Satan tempts him. And three times, Jesus responds with the same response, basically anchoring himself in his father's revelation, his father's word given to him. Here's the story in Matthew 4. It's recorded. The tempter, that Satan, came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus is hungry. He's been 40 days without food, right? Jesus answered, It is written. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And again, Satan comes to him, you know, well, you know, I'll give you all these kingdoms, these power. You just worship me. It says, it is written. And on it goes. And so 
Basically, three times Jesus anchors himself, uses the sword of the Spirit to respond to Satan's temptation. Is what is what Jesus used. It is what we have been given. The church, you have the sword of the Spirit. You have the Word of God. You have what it takes. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians these beautiful words that talk about the battle that we're in and what we have. Verse, chapter 10, 3, and five, 3 through 5. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. Okay? So here, just, be, just a word of caution. We talk about this battle thing. Just, just let's not go. This battle is not a worldly battle. All right? This is a battle of spiritual realities. It's a, ba- it's a battle, but it's not, it's not a, a battle done in the flesh. It's done by God's spirit by his word, by his ways, in light of his gospel. It's truly a battle, but it's not the same kind of battle that we tend to think of, okay? And we, you know, a lot of times we can kind of go sideways and, and really give this battle language a chance for our flesh to kind of like, yeah, we're going to... It's like, you know, just be careful of that kind of spirit and talk, okay? So, back to the text. Uh, we don't wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world, Okay? The world goes power. Jesus says, come and die. The world says it's all about authority and it's all about, you know, kind of exterior. And the and gospel says it's all about your heart and what's going on inside, you know? So the world is completely opposite. It's a kingdom upside down, all right? We fight with not with weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds, all right? Don't settle for earthly power and we've got the word of God that can change hearts and lives. Don't go the way of power and, and prestige and, and authority in the earthly realm when we've got the all-powerful, life-changing word of God that can demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. It's not passive, all right? This is an active use of God's word and the tools he has given us. My friends, the word of God is alive. It creates, it brings from nothing into things into existence. In Genesis 1, it says the world was formless and void. There was nothing. And then God spoke and there was light. And on goes God spoke, then there was created world and God spoke God's word is has the power to create that which is not there it brings into existence that which does not exist and so we're so tempted to think well you know this is how the world works this is the natural laws and that's the only way things can be right that's where we and we limit God and kind of our experience to that and God says no I'm able to create and undo things that you can never imagine. His word, the word of God is powerful and active. It's living. It creates. It brings things to exist that did not exist. He creates. The word actually is ex nilo, out of nothing. God creates out of nothing. He does the impossible. He wrote the laws of nature. He can undo them, okay? Okay? Jesus is coming towards the end of his ministry and he goes a few days late to a funeral for a friend. His friend Lazarus has passed away and Mary and Martha are so distraught they didn't come and he waited and he waited and they bury the guy and he's three days inside the cave and he's not smelling so good, okay? (laughs) He's been three days in a Middle Eastern culture. Just do the the imagination, what it's like, right? And he... And he says, roll the stone away. And they go, don't do this, Jesus. It's not good because you don't want to smell dead people. And he goes, roll the stone away. And by the word of his mouth, he says, Lazarus, come forth. And a dead person, by the power of the word of Christ, comes to life. I'm like, my word. How does that happen? It's unbelievable. It's impossible. You're right. It is. God does what is impossible through the words of his mouth and that dead person, Lazarus, comes back to life. (laughs) That's amazing what God can do. He does the impossible. 
God's word divides even to the very inner part of our being. It says in Hebrews that he divides to the soul and spirit, joint and marrow, judging the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God's word reveals us to ourselves. In confirmation, we talk about God's word, and one of the met words uh, that we use is that God's word is like a mirror. It shows us ourself. It shows us who we are. It reveals the thoughts and intentions of the heart, it says in Hebrews. Thoughts and attitudes. It's a mirror. So this morning, most of you, when you got up, at some point in your morning, you looked in the mirror, and you made some action steps, right? You said, well, you know, oh, my hair looks funny. I guess I got to shave, you know, whatever. I got this, that. You got to fix whatever, you know, got to do stuff, right? And But not one of you, I got a feeling, did this. You looked in the mirror, and then you went out, and you grabbed a stone out of your garden, and you went and you smashed that mirror. You go, oh, that stupid mirror. I, that mirror sh- is showing me who I am. And I don't like who I am. You didn't blame the mirror, right? I hope nobody did that this morning. If you did, seek help. Um, talk, call me, all right? Uh, God's word shows us ourself. It's not the word's fault when our heart is shown. It's our heart's fault. And that is a gift of grace that God gives us when he shows us our heart because then we're able to hear the good news that there's, we're not stuck with our heart. That he takes our wounded, broken, idolatrous heart, gives us a new one. But until we know kind of what we need, we don't really need what he offers. At least we don't think we do, right? So, he creates faith. He demolishes stronghold. He reveals truth. So, how do we respond? What do we do? How do we live in light of what God's word is? All right? I have eight things we're going to blast through super fast because we got eight things and we don't have all afternoon. So, I'm going to run through these. And hear, that's where they are. We, we hear it. We read it. We sing it. We marinate in it. We're changed by it. We study it. Stand on it. Believe it. All of these from God's word. And I'm going to have you guys read these as we go through them. Because you are reading, using the sword of the spirit as you do. First of all, we hear it. So join, join me. Read this out loud together. Faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. Faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. In your worship folder on the, on the inside back cover, what is that, inside back cover? I don't even know what that means. Inside, right-hand side, the value of public worship as a family. I wrote a, a brief article, it was in there last week, and this is an encouragement for you to bring your kiddos to church with you and the importance of public worship. And it's important not just for kids but for adults. And here I think one of, one of the most powerful things that happens when we gather as a fellowship and as a church body is it's beautiful and, and really it's, it's awesome, awesome in, a, in, a kind of, in a holy kind of way. And that is, I mean, you think about it. We have maybe 200 some people here this morning. Here in this group, someone is maybe about at the end of their rope. They're feeling hopeless. You may feel like you had some incredible bad news. Maybe it's a hopelessness in your home or your family or something discouraging at work. Something, you're, you're completely empty. And, but, and there's also people here that have had beautiful weeks, you know, maybe. You had, a, you had a news of a child to be born or an engagement or you had a wedding and it's just awesome, beautiful things. And you have, you have these two extremes of, of experiences gathered here and then we sing this song. Everyone sings one song. Like we don't allow, you know, kind of, okay, now for those of you in this stage of life, you sing this song. Those of the rest of you, you sing this song. No, we sing one song and we hear one word preached. And as you sing that song, it's like God goes, way to go. Those of you discouraged at the end of your rope, way to go. And those of you joyous, way to acknowledge that this is all a gift from God. And it's beautiful and holy and wonderful. And our hearts 
are shaped and formed as we worship together. And our kids, our children, their hearts are informed and shaped by that. And they're learning the words and the language of the faith and, and what it means. You know, they may not understand the word like salvation or grace when they're 18 months, but they're learning the words and they're learning to put meaning to those as they grow into them. You know, it's, it's kind of, you know, people say, well, kids don't understand the sermon. Yeah, I understand they don't understand all of it, but they're picking up the foundations of it and they're learning about it. It's kind of like, we don't tell our kids who don't walk, well, when you learn to walk, come back and walk. Like, huh, how does that work? You know, don't they learn how to walk by falling down? And shouldn't, shouldn't, there, shouldn't we learn about faith by kind of stumbling through it and struggling and working along with it? And so kids grow into and learn the language of faith and they see modeled the beautiful reality of a worshiping family and they see these people hear the stories of people honoring God and loving God and following him in spite of and in the midst of their difficulties and faith is being caught. They're learning it. So here it faith comes from hearing the message and message is heard through the word of Christ. All right, next one. I won't spend this much time on each one, but we're gonna move on. We're on read it. Join me. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, it's it's using reading God's word. Think about it. Is there really much difference between the person who can't read and doesn't than the person who can read and doesn't? Is there really much difference? At the end of the day, there isn't any. Right? So if you can read, read. Read God's word. Read it. Study it. Feed it into your mind. Now, I just want, I know reading is not always easy for some of you, but for those, if, you, if it is, if it's not easy for you, there's, there's ways, like, I just, I listened to this Bible app this last week, just to sample it out a little bit, and it's this beautiful thing on Bible Gateway, that's the Bible app I use, and, uh, and you can audio Bible, and you push it, and you have this guy read who has this awesome English accent. He sounds way better than, like, my Norwegian brogue accent, right? It's awesome. So you can listen like you're shaving. You like push Psalm 23. Have it spoken to you. Whatever. You can do that. You can get God's word into you if you get a little creative and use some of the beautiful gifts that we have. So read it. All right, let's move on. Sing it. Let's read this together. Join me. Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. All right, this is just a little bit earlier in Ephesians chapter 5. It doesn't say sing and make music to your heart, those of you who are classically trained musicians and sing perfectly on tune, okay? Sing those of you who won the karaoke contest, you know, last year at your family reunion. No, it says sing, Make music with your heart. I can't tell you how many times I've been at the bedside of of someone or in the room with someone who's in the last chapters of their life and you start to sing a song like Great is Thy Faithfulness or Amazing Grace and you think that they're not with you, they're not listening, and they start to sing. It's powerful. and It's holy. But that that song didn't get into their heart just that, that moment. It got into their... 40, 50, 60, 80 years earlier. When they remember it, when they sang that song, they knew it from memory. And it's beautiful. Music is such a powerful tool to, to leak God's word into the crevices of our soul that maybe other avenues don't. It's a beautiful tool, so sing it. Sing it with kids. Sing it. Um, I've heard of a lot of kids, you know, they, we hear these songs, we sing these songs Sunday morning, and then they sing them during the week, and it's like, that's beautiful. So sing, make music to the Lord from your heart. All right. Marinate in it. All right, from Deuteronomy. Join me. Read them. These commands that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. 
Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Listen to what it doesn't say. These commands that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Uh, take your kids once uh, every two weeks to Sunday school where they, for an hour, study God's Word. No, what does it say? When you sit down, all right? When you get up. When you lay down. Okay, look at this. Okay, ah, oh, yeah. Wake up. It's time to talk about God's Word again. That's what you do. When you fall asleep, when you wake up, we're talking about God's Word. See, here's the thing. Here's the beautiful thing. When you when you speaking God's word in the mix of your life, we it, it's like it helps us, it breaks kind of this this sacred secular wall down. This like, well, this is kind of church stuff and this is real life stuff. It's God is all over everything. And we just don't see it or recognize it or acknowledge it. So this is what we do. We marinate in it, you know. You take a chicken breast and you put it in a Ziploc bag and you put some Western or not Western Italian dressing in there and you zip it up and you let it marinate. And it tastes so good. That's how, that's how life when it's marinated in the gospel. God's word becomes good. All right, move it on. I'm not going to lay down again, okay? Just some of you might take a nap. All right, be changed by it. Let's move on. Read Romans 12, 2 with me. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That word said, don't let the world squish you into its mold, okay? It's like, don't like be played on when you get squished into the mold, all right? We're transformed. Our mind is changed as we renew it according to what God says is true. We're changed by it. And that happens in ways that, like, it's like, it's a miracle. It's like, yeah, that's what God's word does. Is it changes us as, we're, as we interact with it, as we marinate on it. All right. Number 12, study it. Here, listen to this from Acts 17, 11, the story of a church. Read it with me. Now, the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. So the church in Berea studied the word and you go, man, this Paul guy, he said this. Is that true? My friends, you should be, like, be going home and go, man, Pastor Rich said this, this, this. Is that true? Me- measure it against what God says in his word. It's not, you know, it shouldn't be taken just because I'm the pastor or just because I'm here with the audience that it's true. It's matched against what God says. Is it true? We study it. We encourage you to be involved in groups. Study God's word. You know, it's, it's a powerful thing to hear, to take in Sunday morning. But it's equally as powerful to be connected and communicating and studying in a more informal atmosphere where you can talk about ideas. So in small groups, maybe with a group of men or a group of women or a home group, Encourage you to to jump in, be a part of one. They can be life-changing for you. If you you would like to but don't know where, you can talk to me and we can figure that out. Maybe you can start one. It could be, it's a beautiful way to interact with God's word, to let it leak and change us and leak into our souls and change us by studying it. Okay, two more. Stand on it. Therefore, read this with me. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything, to stand. My friends, we stand on God's word. It's our, it's our foundation. We have a church, we have official statements which we hold to which are really important upon the truthfulness and the reliability of the biblical text that we can believe it, we can stand on it, we can hold to it, that it is without error, we can trust it, that we say the Bible is God's word, it doesn't just contain God's word, it is God's word, it's not like, well, you know, this part here is God's word, 
This part here, no, let's take that out. That's, that can't be true. God couldn't have done that, right? It's too, this is too complicated, too hard to understand. No, we stand on God's word officially. And my friends, it's, this is so important and it matters. You know, it seems like, oh, that's kind of dry theological stuff. No, it matters because we have something to stand on. As a, as a church family, and as pastors, and as individuals, the statement, because the statement is aligned with what is true. We don't have something to say just because a church has a statement. The statement is what is true. The Bible is reliable. You can stand on it. You can rely on it. You can build on it. My friends, and then the, this verse is given to us, not so we can have a... A, a statement on our website or on our official records, as important as that is, but it's given for us in the battle that you are facing. Each of us are facing a battle of our soul and our minds. It's a battle of faith and doubt, a battle of are we going to stand firm on the truth of who God is and what he's told us? Or am I going to follow a lie? Stand, we stand on it, and we use the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, because it's reliable, it's true. And lastly, we believe it. We believe it. My friends, this book is written not so you can study it, so you can win the Bible trivia game at your next family reunion, as fun as that would be to win. And it's a good thing to study the Bible. We just talked about that. The Bible says to study it, to read it. But the goal is not so we become smarter and have more Bible facts in our head. Not evil, but that's not the goal of the Bible. The goal of the Bible is written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. And by believing you have life in his name, I have come, Jesus said, that you may have life. And have it to the full. And this is the letter that tells us about this Savior, Jesus. This is the way. These things are written so that I may believe. That I may have victory over the evil one. And resting in the promises that are given to us in this book. It's his love letter to us. It shapes us and forms us. Yes, it does it. But at the heart of it, it's written to draw us into the heart of God. He loves me. And he will never leave me. He'll never forsake me. That his promises are true. That no matter what happens around me and it seems impossible, I can rest. That he is mine and I am his. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, forgive us. We're so quick to think we're smarter than it. No more. So forgive us and help us to rest in your promises, your truth in you. In your name we pray.